Cool. Um, thanks everybody for coming. I know it's uh, busy times being a student for sure, with midterms and everything. So I really appreciate you taking your time and coming here today. Others as well. Time I got nothing precious. better to do, Ted. I gotta come see you every Wednesday. <laughs> thanks. Uh, working up here at the university is very special to me. It's really been rewarding, and so um, I should also say welcome and thank you for everyone who appears online. We've had up to 40 live in one lecture this week, and the lectures get watched hundreds of times in the YouTube channel as well. And so welcome, and thanks for coming out there as well. So today's lecture is uh, Canvas Activism. In many ways, uh, I would like to think I'm as much of a specialist in the field as, as anyone, having been working for well over 15 years uh, trying to legalize cannabis. And I've given my story before of the history of hempology and stuff, so I don't really want to dwell into that today. And in the past, I've done very general lectures on cannabis activism. Today, I really want to focus on what's happening here in Canada with Bill S-10 and various forms of activism that we can engage in to try and fight these mandatory minimum sentences. And so, uh, thanks for coming in. Um, I'll be kind of mixing in a bunch of work that I'm doing and Hempology's sort of style of activism and in particular, again, uh, address the mandatory minimums. And so, just in general, uh, Bill S-10, which I'm going to speak about, is currently before the Senate. I believe right now, actually, there's probably people online with uh, the, the lecture open on one page and the Senate hearings on the other. Um, this week, there's been a variety of people testifying from various uh, police agencies and uh, Crown prosecutors and all sorts of individuals interested in drug policy. And cannabis activists such as myself have focused on the parts of these laws of S10 that have six months sentences for six plants. If there's other circumstances that they call aggravating factors, for instance, children in the home if it's in a residential area, if it's in a rented home, there's an extra three months detached for the six plants. And otherwise, the you know, aggravating factors uh, are really, um, like I say, to be in a rented property or even in a residential neighborhood um, would really cover the vast majority of people um, buying and selling illegal drugs, period. Um, as far as I'm concerned, a small percentage actually happens visibly on the street. The majority of drug dealing and certainly uh, cannabis growing happens in residential neighborhoods. And so S10 covers not just selling cannabis, uh, I believe producing cannabis extracts like making hashish or making a pot cookie as an 18 month sentence. Um, there's other mandatory minimum sentences for dealing in other drugs as well for importing and exporting. They've really thrown in a whole bunch of different, uh, what they're calling drug crimes, in together, which is what sort of the conservatives like to do and the people we're up against. It's like all drugs are bad if it's not made by a drug company and synthesized. Uh, and so uh, um, it, it's something that uh, they've grouped it together, which has been hard to get the message out in some ways. But in the other, uh, on the other hand, it sort of forces us cannabis activists to be outright anti-prohibitionists. And I think uh, one of the first things that someone who starts to follow the road of cannabis activism learns is that really the whole drug war is a complete, uh, on some hand, a farce and a, and a folly, but on the other hand, just completely devastating the number of people being killed. And so, uh, you know, informing yourself about drug policy in general is really important um, beyond cannabis uh, because you need to convince people that we can't just say, oh, go after the crackheads down the street, leave us potheads alone. You need to be able to 
uh, if you're going to be an activist in any sense, stand up to the whole drug war. And uh, that, to me, has uh, been something I've done for a long time. I've been nicknamed Acid Head Ted for over two, two decades now. Been an anti-prohibitionist and very outspoken about it for, for a long time, and it served me quite well. So, uh, yeah, uh, one of the first things you learn when you're wanting to be a cannabis activist is that you're really, in some ways, a, a drug policy uh, advocate. And so, uh, anyway, Bill S. Ten is a, a perfect example of us being forced into that. We can't just talk cannabis policy without talking about the other drugs and the effects that they have. Anyway, that's Bill S-10 before the Senate and the committee's hearing reports, but it's very heavily laden with conservative senators, and so uh, uh, and we're expecting it to pass through that committee and uh, then it will be put before the House of Commons where the Liberals will be put in a position to vote for or against it. And uh, it appears as though the majority of the Liberals are gonna vote for it because they don't wanna look soft on crime. So that's Bill S-10. Well, now what to do about Bill S-10 is uh, something that has been really hard to do because being here in particular, it's sort of like, pin the tail on the donkey, and the donkey's got his ass really well covered, it's the other side of the mountain, so it's kind of hard to take a direct shot at it. And, but nevertheless, it's really important for us to try to get the message through to people in Ottawa, but the way I see that happening is through the people that live from here to Ottawa, because we're all neighbors, we all work together, we all you know, commute together on the bus or meet in various venues, and, the best way for us to kind of get the message out and to work together, my firm belief has always been just one person at a time, one day at a time, one meeting at a time. And so, uh, you know, hempology, the, the, the strategy of activism, you know, can be phrased in different ways. When people ask me what hempology does, I'll say, you know, the short form is uh, legalization by education. That was sort of the mantra when I started to go to hempology meetings in Vancouver, I guess 16 years ago, coming up January was the first ones I went to. And what struck me about the hempology meetings was that we were talking about very serious matters, you know, and with medical marijuana, matters of, of life and death. Uh, in many ways, environmentally, I would think that we're talking life and death as well. We need to learn how to not only cooperate instead of compete for natural resources, but use those resources that are the most beneficial to us and, and the environment. And the cannabis plant, I think, has the potential to produce so many things that would benefit us and would be very light on the planet to do that, like food with the protein. Like, you know, I, I'm a, you know, very much a, a hemp nut, and I ideally would be consuming so fewer resources on the planet if we were eating plant proteins instead of vegetable proteins, you would be eating a lot of growth hormones and stuff. So while education by, or sorry, legalization by education is hempology's general theme, you know, really it's, it's cannabis in action too, um, because buying hemp and eating hemp and stopping, you know, your, your money from going into these corporations that are essentially chewing up our planet's resources and buying up family farms like my family, like I'm seven generation farmer on both sides. First generation not born and raised on the farm. I've got aunts and uncles that live on farms. I don't think there's a single one of my cousins that's going to be able to afford buying the family farms. Like the dairy quota is being sold out this year because none of my cousins can afford that. So that's going to be bought up some, by some big dairy quota or big dairy factory. And you know, it's really sad to see family farms being sucked up. And you know, uh, I'm, I'm the generation that's being separated from that uh, because of these industrial freaks, so I, I'm really cognizant of who I'm supporting when I buy my food. I and mean, your money is really the biggest power that many of us have. Well, not the biggest, I'll never give it that, or mine by far. It's, but, you know, our money is our votes. You think you vote every once in a while, and that's how you did help decide what's going on. Well, that's not true at all. It's where you spend your money, and that money gets used either to lobby the government for for them to, to monopolize various industries or that money gets used for family farms and communities. So buying hemp and wearing hemp and eating it is very much a way of being a cannabis activist and getting involved in the hemp industry in any way too. 
know, 16 years ago hemp was illegal in Canada, and now there's just a multitude of industries and things that are happening. There's stores all over selling stuff. You can work as a distributor for somebody or set up events. All sorts of things are possible. And, and being involved in the hemp industry, again, is being an activist. And so uh, anyway, the, the long version of hempology, I'd like to think, is participatory education in constant passive civil disobedience. And that you know, is a big phrase. I, I really like to throw civil in there because I've learned that when I do my work downtown and otherwise with the, the police and the authorities watching me, as long as we're behaving fairly responsibly, we're going to get away with a fair amount. You know, if we're just kind of going crazy and there's a bunch of people wrestling in the corner and, and, and just a, a, a real kind of sense of chaos around the work we do, well, you know, that would give us an image of being very much like a mob. But whether it's forming a circle or the way we, we engage with the public, um, you know, I think it's really important for us to be civil. It would be great to have parties and, and be all like, you know, fun and games, but uh, we want to convince people that don't smoke pot to agree with us. And so, uh, in all times and cases, even when I'm getting arrested and I'm coming up the 10 year anniversary of some of my arrests, I've been exceedingly polite, almost like uber polite when I'm starting to get arrested. It's almost uh, something that makes them nervous because, you know, I'm being really nice to them and they're taking my life away at times. And so, it really puts them in a, a very different position than when they're dealing with criminals. And so dealing with the police in any circumstances gives you a chance to be an activist, especially if you don't have any pot on you, because then you don't have to worry about anything. It's like, okay, I can you know, talk with this officer about cannabis and prohibition and this, that, and the other thing, and really try and inform them. And yeah, it's something that, that I've succeeded quite well at, to the point where some cops don't even want to talk to me because they're just tired of hearing of it, right? Like, but otherwise, uh, you know, they know I'm, I'm very respectful and, uh, and not just kind of, uh, um, you know, calling them names. I, I don't blame the police for prohibition any more than I blame loggers for deforestation or, you know, other people that work in industries that I don't really believe in, but that's what they're doing. And so, you know, uh, it's not something where, you know, like if somebody acts up and does something stupid, I'll call them on it. But, you know, I don't really blame people for being sucked into the way the world works. I feel sorry for them. Anyway, cannabis activism, Bill S-10. So, um, last year, um, after we had the, well, I, I should even go back to Bill C-15 and then Bill C-26. These mandatory minimums are nothing new. Uh, the government, uh, under the conservative minority uh, 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 umbrella, has uh, um, enacted or tried to three times these very same sets of laws. And uh, the first two were essentially beaten when the government uh, probed, I guess, over the uh, holidays. Uh, I think the last two years in a row, even I mean, don't fall on that closely. But anyway, um, we have come very close to these mandatory minimums being brought into uh, effect. And, and in a lot of ways, we're lucky they're not there. Um, but uh, the first time it came around, uh, national rallies were called. and. We did, I, I would like to think better than anyone in the country. We had both Denise Savoie, a member of parliament uh, uh, and uh, from the NDP, and federal uh, and a liberal Dr. Keith Martin uh, come and speak out against the conservatives and, and I think C-15 at the time. Um, so we were the only rally in the country that I think even had a member of parliament come speak, let alone two from two different parties. I think really shows how well respected we are, but also how mature people are out here in general. You know, where politicians feel very safe speaking out against prohibition, it's a sign of how the general community feels about the very issue. So, um, so then, uh, um, you know, but really the rallies, if we had the biggest one in the country, and there was probably maybe 30 people there if I stretch it, um, it really is a sign of, I would unfortunately say that the lack of coordination and, uh, and, and momentum in the cannabis movement right now in Canada. And it's been very frustrating to be fighting these bills at times and feeling very alone. Now, not to say we're the only ones in the country. There's a few individuals, to be sure. Um, uh, there's a web page, uh, I think frankdiscussion.ca. It's probably the most uh, 
on the ball when it comes to what's happening with Bill West 10. Um, I believe he